Good morning, and you're very welcome to this morning's signpost webinar, which is brought to you by Chagask. Uh, my name is Pat Murphy, Head of Environment Knowledge Transfer. Uh, and this morning, I'm delighted to be joined by, by two colleagues. Um, uh, uh, Mairead Whitty is the project lead with the Farming for Water EIP, which is, has been established over the, la the last year. And Ema Connery is an, an, an ASAP advisor with, with Chagas, operating in Cork, but has been working closely with the Farming for Water EIP over the last year. You're very welcome, ladies. Thank you. Thank you. I'm also joined uh, for questions by, by Carl Summer. So, Carl Summers, Carl, you're very welcome. Morning, Pat. Uh, back in 2018, the ASAP service was, was established. And uh, when it, I suppose, began operations, it worked with farmers to try and encourage them to take on uh, measures to improve water quality in uh, priority areas for action. So generally areas where water quality was, was challenged. However, in that job, there was one big challenge that, that faced the, the advisors, and that was potentially the lack of funding to deal with maybe some of the, the more costly measures that, that were being proposed. So uh, a request to the Department of, of Agriculture, Food and the Marine, and the Department of, of uh, Housing, Local Government and Heritage for potential funding yielded uh, what has now become the Farming for Water EIP, where they committed uh, 60 million to support those, those actions uh, in uh, those uh, priority areas for actions and in, uh, in other priority areas where we're, we're trying to work on water quality. Uh, that's the background. Uh, Mairead, you're going to give us, a, I suppose, a, a further background to the yeah. uh, programme and to the establishment of, of, of the programme and, and give us an idea of how it works. Yep, that's right, Pat. Um, okay, and, share and, my screen. and Emer then will follow on with uh, some detailed examples of the uh, applicant of the um, measures that may be applied for, and and potentially some examples to give people a, a flavour of what an application might look like. Yep. So, if you can share your presentation, Mairead. Okay, Thanks, we're Pat. Seeing, we're seeing that. Okay, just to give you a bit of background, um, we talk about the Farming for Water EIP. So what exactly is an EIP? So it's co-funded by the EU and the Government of Ireland through the two departments, Department of Agriculture, Food and the Marine, Department of Housing, Local Government and Heritage. And it brings together farmers, scientists and other experts to work together um, to test out new practices. So it's, it's road testing ideas and practices that can be adopted more widely. Um, and, that, and that's what it's all about. Pat went through the kind of background, so I'll just touch on this very quickly. So um, the process that was in, in place, as he mentioned, from 2018 was that LawPro, who I work for, do a catchment assessment. They look at the various water bodies and what is impacting on them and where they identify a particular pressure, uh, they refer to the pressure owner. Um, so where agriculture is identified as the particular pressure, they send a referral to the asset programme and to those advisors who will then engage farmers in that area and go out and do a farm-based assessment to look at water quality issues and what is actually happening on the farm. And that covers a multitude, but one of the one of the things highlighted in that are supplementary measures, so measures that go over and above compliance. Um, but as Pat mentioned, that review identified that the implementation of those supplementary measures had been hampered by a lack of funding. So obviously um, people were sorting out their compliance issues first, which is natural, and then um, the, the lack of funding hampered those uh, supplementary measures. So the Farming for Water EIP came into being. So 60 million euro of an agri-environmental scheme for farmers. It runs to the end of 2027. 50 million euro of that is ring-fenced for payments for farmers to cover the cost of those supplementary measures. And that, that is through the Department of Agriculture, Food and the Marine and co-funded by the EU. And then the Department of Housing, Local Government and Heritage are putting up the 10 million euro for the operational costs. So to put in the processes, staffing and all the procedures around the implementation of the scheme and the pro and the, the running of that scheme. It's managed by Law Pro in partnership with Chagas and Dairy Industry Ireland. And it's the final step of that asset process. So it's building on the asset structure that's there and the advisory team that's there and coming in at the end with funding to implement those supplementary measures. The aim is to engage up to 15,000 farmers. Now, the project is focused on water quality, but there's also co-benefits um, that can be brought into play for a lot of those nature-based solution um, measures. 
uh, looking at biodiversity and the likes of climate actions. Eligibility then, it's a targeted approach, so it's not an open call. The focus is on areas where water quality needs to be restored. So 50 million euro in funding is a lot of money, but at the same time, it's a national scheme. So spread nationally, it, it can get very small very quickly. So we need to focus where that funding is going. So the focus is the second cycle and third cycle priority areas for action where agriculture has been identified as that significant pressure. And the farms in those areas will be assessed where to see where there's a requirement for measures. So there might be a farm in the area that doesn't require those measures. Um, and we're also looking at the nitrate vulnerable areas in the southeast and trying to bring in all dairy farmers in those areas. The project was launched in March of this year um, on the farm of David and Roisin Fay near Loch Ennell by Minister McConlog, Minister Noonan and Senator Hackett. And the reason that location was chosen was because through the ASAP programme, there had been previously measures installed, um, very similar to the measures that we are offering, and those measures had brought about a water quality improvement. There's a number of focus areas of the project, um, localised information. So uh, letting farmers know exactly what's happening in their local water body, bringing it home to them and, and their local area. Understanding what measures are needed. So understanding, OK, I've recommended this. Why have I recommended this? What is this combating uh, and what's it going to do for water quality? Bringing training into it then and let uh, training farmers up on best practice so that they can, when they're making decisions in the future, they know well what good looks like. Promotion as well. So we're looking at, I suppose, highlighting where good practice is in place, where people have done an awful lot of work for water quality and where it has had an impact. Um, so I suppose highlighting the, the positive things in an agricultural setting. We're building on community-led initiatives. As part of the project team, we're going to be bringing in five community animators. So these will be roles um, embedded in existing groups that have a water quality focus. So the likes of the Rivers Trusts and building on the work that they have done already in the network that they have in place. Measures then, obviously, uh, sector-wide adoption of best practice measures. Um, so we've, we've selected 43 measures within the scheme and we'll be trying to get those implemented where appropriate. Validation of those measures. So we have a research hub set up um, that I'll discuss further later on. And then the knowledge transfer. So the reporting side of it. Um, and that's, I suppose, the whole point of the project is to road test those measures and how effective that they are. So uh, carrying out that reporting to inform policy. One of the innovations of the project then is the rainwater management plan. And this is the only mandatory measure that we have in the scheme. And this is essentially a collaborative effort between the farmer and the advisor. The advisor comes out with the science um, based approach that referred from law pro where it's available. Um, and But then the talks to the farmer and sees well, what's actually happened on the ground. So we have a study here that has identified these as pressures. Well, but what is actually impacting the farm? Um, so looking at then what's the most appropriate measure for those risks. And the rainwater management plan looks at where the, the water moves across the farmyard um, to highlight those risky areas and, and identify what can be put in to combat that risk. And the measures then, as I mentioned, we have 43 measures and Eva will go into a bit more detail on some of these measures, but they're generally broken into source control measures, pathway interceptor measures and receptor measures. Um, so obviously the type of measures that will be implemented on a farm will depend on the pressure that's there, uh, the land that's there, the, the soil type, um, the farm practice that's been carried out in the area. So each application is bespoke to the farm in question. I mentioned then our research hub, and this is part of the innovation. Our validation will be done through the research hub. So we have researchers brought together in a group from many different institutions, some of them are listed there, UCD, UCC, um, and including the Chagas ACP programme. Um, so the researchers, it's a mutually beneficial um, arrangement whereby the researchers will have access to our sites and will be able to build their research projects around the measures um, that will be put in place. They can then use that access and ability to access sites to support applications for funding and other funding streams supported by the project. Um, so it just means that then that 50 million euro in funding goes directly to farmers to fund the cost of installing these measures. Um, we'll also be looking at some internal monitoring and testing to bridge gaps and validation. And they first met in May, so that's an ongoing process there. 
Um, progress highlights then, I suppose we've done an awful lot of work in the project. We initially started last year with pilots. Um, the project then was launched in May. So we have 43 measures that covers all the, the various pressures. We also have a bespoke option. So we're very conscious of the fact that I suppose every farm is different. We've tried to cover all the scenarios, but um, we also we want to leave the project open for innovation. So if a farmer has a good idea or a group of farmers have an idea that can have a water quality benefit, we can look at that under a bespoke option. Um, so we've road tested those measures and we've road tested our process and we've made some amendments based on the farmer and the advisor feedback. Um, so this is slightly different from maybe departmental schemes where the, the structure is quite rigid. Um, initially, um, in our case, we had the flexibility to make those changes because we want to make it workable for the farmer and workable for the advisors. We've developed our specification document and guidance on that. As I mentioned, we've done a number of different pilots, including a tillage pilot in the southwest or southeast, sorry, um, in the ACP catchment there in Castle Dockerel. So we'll be bringing in the, the monitoring aspect of that um, to the ACP and the research hub. We've The project, I suppose, as I mentioned at the start, is built around the ASAP structure and the ASAP team that's there already. So we've been working with them over the last, um, I suppose, 10 months, um, identifying their training needs, bringing them up to speed, working through the application process with them, um, working through the actual mechanics of making an application and also the assessment process out on the ground. Um, so at this stage now, we've uh, applications received from each of the dairy processors and they've all looked at a, a target water bodies where they can focus their efforts to get a critical mass of farmers in. So they'll be starting with one water body and obviously moving to others um, where their supplier base is, but they've selected their initial water bodies. And we've also done a lot of engagement then over the summer months to try and promote the project and also, um, I suppose, give information to farmers around the thing, the questions that they have essentially. How do they get into the scheme? How, what does it mean for them? The project then, I suppose we're doing an awful lot of collaboration with industry. Dairy Industry Island are a project partner. So they're an integral part of the project. Um, they are they are represented on our operational group and our strategic oversight committee. And they're involved in all the decision-making processes around what we're putting in place here. We're also working with the sustainability leads of those dairy processors to integrate the farming for water EIP into their action plans. Um, so making them, and um, I suppose, making the EIP part of those actions that they can um, get sustainability payments for. Um, as I mentioned, then the obviously the dairy processors make up um, a lot of that ASAP advisory team. So they've around thirty. That number is in, increasing um, on an ongoing basis. So they've around thirty at the moment, and and they're obviously then part of the support structures that we have in place. And we're also looking at Meat Industry Ireland and seeing where the meat processors can support the project. They want to play a part in the ongoing efforts to improve water quality. Um, so we've had discussions with them as to how they can do that. And I suppose they've talked about the commitments that they can give up to and including providing additional advisors. Um, so more boots on the ground to bring the project um, to life. And then outside the ASAP project, we've mobilized ASAP now. We're looking at other areas where we can bring in applications. Um, so working with the likes of the OPW, um, the Department of Transport on Nature-Based Solutions to Manage Runoff, um, the Group Water Schemes, um, they're doing an awful lot of work on the ground. So leveraging that work and that network of farmers and also with Ishka Air. And so any areas that where we can, I suppose, bring in a collaboration if we're both doing um, works on water quality, well, how do we work together to maximise uh, the effort there? And now Emer is going to go into a bit more detail on some of the measures in the scheme and the actual practical application of the project. Thanks for that, that was very comprehensive. Uh, Emer, if you want to come on screen and then share. Okay, we have that. Fire ahead. Okay, thanks, Pat. Thanks, Maureen. Um, okay, so I'm just going to go through um some of the measures that are available for funding to farmers, uh, some of the mitigation measures. 
uh, where farmers meet the basic entry um, and eligibility criteria to, to get into the Farming for Water EIP. So just to give you a flavour of what's available um, for funding. Um, so you can see here, um, as Marie said, there's 43 different measures that um, farmers can potentially receive funding um, for from the Farm for Water EIP. Um, the basic, I suppose, entry uh, criteria would initially be a BIS, a BIS application in the current year. Um, so a farmer has to have a department um, ID number, such as a herd number. Um, once once you have that and you fall within the, the eligibility criteria, like the areas for action and so on, um, the basic entry requirement then would be a rainwater management plan. So basically the rainwater management plan, um, it follows on from the, the ASAP assessment that the ASAP advisors carry out. Um, so every each ASAP assessment contains three parts. So there's the farmyard assessment, the land assessment and the nutrient management assessment. So each of those three parts of any ASAP assessment really form the basis for which measures will suit each farm, uh, where the mitigation measures would be most um, suitable and most effective. So a baseline ASAP assessment is critical um, and that really forms then the basis for the rainwater management plan where you know it, it's outlined on the maps and you follow the flow of water um, through the farmyard and through the farm. So you're really trying to identify where water flows, where it potentially picks up nutrients um, and sediment and where those are potentially lost then to both the drainage network and the river network. And it's once you identify those, I suppose, within the farm um, that you can really identify the critical source areas the overland flow pathways and where the, the mitigation measures then would be uh, most effective. So you can see here on the, the table that's in front of you, all 43 measures are listed here. They're color coded. So generally this kind of lighter, uh, I suppose, beige color would predominantly be the, the source control measures. Um, these will I suppose, generally speaking, be more suited to the free draining soil type. So where nitrate is um, a critical um, nutrient of concern within that water body. So I suppose you have there uh, one particular measure, the nitrogen surplus, multi-species swords and catch crops. They would be, I suppose, really key measures to address nitrogen um, surpluses and trying to reduce those on farms. Um, there are other measures there to deal with pesticides where pesticides may be an issue within a water body. So low drift nozzles, mobile drip trays and water storage tanks. Um, so those are simple measures that farmers can avail um, funding for where where there will be a water quality benefit from those. The, the measures there that are highlighted in blue, then they are the pathway interception measures. So these will be predominantly where you have phosphorus and sediment as the key issue within the water body. These are targeted towards the overland flow pathways and um, the delivery points. So there are things like the, uh, the hedgerows with the earthen mound, uh, where you would try to target these to intercept the overland flow pathways, spatially targeted buffers, which would be extended buffers, um, within certain areas, again, to target those overland flow pathways and delivery points, uh, tree planting within buffer zones, uh, swales, management of critical source areas, water bars, um, you have culverts. So th there is a, a, quite a range of different measures there. Um, and we'll have a look at some of those in a little bit more detail as we go through the presentation. The measures then that are highlighted in green, they would be the receptor measures. So here you would have funding for things like bovine exclusion from water bodies, uh, ovine exclusion where that is causing um, a risk to the water body, solar powered electric fencers, pasture pumps, solar pumps, water trucks, um, vegetated bunded drains. So all of these measures are eligible for funding. But again, each one can only be selected as a result of your ASAP assessment and where between the ASAP advisor and the farmer, you know, you work together in conjunction to identify which which mitigation measures will give um, the best result for water quality. Um, you can see here the ones that are in white. I suppose that would be I, predominantly the bespoke measure that Mairead uh, spoke about where a farmer looks through these measures and, you know, they have another idea themselves that they feel could potentially work and give a benefit to water quality. 
there is potential then to come up with your own individualized um, measure. Uh, to do that, though, you would need the individual details of that proposal are required to be submitted, including the costings. But they definitely would be welcome. And uh, definitely there is quite a much uh, flexibility within the IP to look at those. Um, and there were two other additions then for source control based on advisor feedback. Um, farmyard bucket and brush is one and slurry testing is another. So the farmyard bucket and brush, um, I, I personally feel this could be quite um, an effective measure where it is used effectively um, in helping to keep that kind of uh, grey grey water and the clean concreted yards um, clean and tidy. So, so if we just take a look at a rainwater management plan, what it entails, um, again, like I say, it's based on the ASAP assessment. Um, so what you're required to do is to have um, a satellite image of the farmyard. So if we take this example, really what you're looking at is um, quite a large derogation dairy farm. Um, and what, what, what needs to be put on the map here is the flow of water through that farmyard, particularly if there is heavy rain um, or cloud bursts. So you're working the preferential flow pathways, trying to follow those to see where nutrients are potentially being picked up and sediment. Mandatory gap cross compliance and nitrates issues um, are separate to the EIP. Um, so all baseline requirements um, have to be adhered to. And the EIP then can fund supplementary measures in, in addition to your baseline requirements. So if you take this farmyard, you can see the light blue arrows. That's the, the flow of water through this farmyard. So, you know, there's some water which is going over clean concreted yards, but it's going out onto the field, which is fine. It's not impacting. Um, but you do have quite a large area of concrete here. And these would be clean yards, but they would be trafficked. So you would have machinery going over these. And these clean yards, uh, particularly with high volumes of rainfall, have the potential to generate a lot of sediment. Um, so in this particular case, um, the farm the farmer is going to look at installing a two chamber farmyard settlement tank to help you know capture that heavy sediment in the first chamber and have the outfall of that two chamber tank into a nature based solution. So in this instance, this is the clean water outlet from the farmyard. This is where the farmer is hoping to put um, the farmyard settlement tank and the outlet of that then will be into a nature based solution, which in this case will be a willow bed. Um, so the idea being that sediment will be captured in the first chamber and then any potential dissolved nutrients that are there would be taken up um, from the growing willow trees. Um, so then if we look at the, the land uh, maps for this particular farm, this, again, it's a derogation farm, but I suppose it's slightly unique in that um, the northern half of the farm is nitrate risky and the lower half of the farm is uh, phosphate risky. So you have free draining soil up here and you have heavier soil down here. You have a lot of the open drain um, coming down along here. And this red line here is the water course. So in this particular case, and this is an example, I mean, there may be other measures suitable, but just as an example to give people an idea, um, in the nitrate risky section, um, multi-species swords can be funded. Water bars um, are not, can also be funded. And generally the water bar to divert water from the farm roadway into sediment traps. Again, just to reduce the volume of sediment and associated nutrients getting into open drains, uh, streams and rivers. The other thing then I suppose would be, um, which is very um, important to, to look at is the overland flow pathways. And, you know, in ASAP, we use the EPA PIP maps all the time. We use the, the PIP N maps, the PIP P and the overland flow pathway and delivery point maps. So in this farm, you can see there is um, an extensive overland flow pathway. The darker color here, the red would indicate that, you know, there's a higher potential for phosphate loss down here. There are quite a number of the red uh, delivery points down here. So we would look to target um, what are called spatially targeted buffers in these areas. So it would be an extended buffer, which would be fenced off and potentially planted with native trees. And that the idea there is to break the, the flow of the water and to reduce the volume of um, sediment and phosphorus getting into the, the drain and into the water course. So just to give you a worked example for that farm in particular, the funding that's available for the rainwater management plan, which is mandatory, the farmer will receive 250 euros for that as a one-off payment. 
Um, that it really the farmers participation in that is critical and the payment really is for the education and the participation in it. Um, there's also a measure there for farmer training where the farmer will receive 156 euro to attend a three hour farmer training course. The nitrogen surplus, which again is to reduce that, um, the, you know, the level of the nitrogen surplus on farms. So you're reducing the amount of um, nitrogen available for leaching. Um, this in particular is focused at the dairy farms in the high PIP N areas. So they will receive 250 euros um, as an annual payment to complete that. The spatially targeted buffers then, um, depending on the size that you go with, in this farmer's case, is he, he's putting in three of them, um, 915 euros each. So again, that's a one-off payment. Um, you can see here, there are some that are one-off payments and there are other payments that are annual. Um, the water bars, a farmer will get 213 euros per water bar. The sediment trap then is an annual payment because it will require maintenance, um, regular maintenance ongoing over the course of the, the EIP. So they receive 120 euros per sediment trap per year. The willow filter bed then, um, that one is on a per meter basis. Um, so in this case, the farm is going to do 70 meters in length of a willow bed. The willow bed is about four to eight meters wide, 34 euros per meter for that. The two chamber farm farmyard settlement tank, um, the farmer will receive up to six and a half thousand euros there, depending on the final cost. If it's cheaper, the payment will be cheaper. So it will be based on receipts for that one, but the maximum is six and a half thousand. The farmyard bucket and brush um, farmers will receive funding there of two thousand euros. Again, so this is up to 50 percent of the cost of the bucket and brush. Um, again, if it's cheaper, you'll get that will be based on receipts. So you'll get 50 percent of the cost and uh, the funding will be, you know, excluding that. The slurry testing then, um, this again, be very beneficial. Um, this is the one off payment and a farmer can avail of up to four slurry um, tests um, per applicant. So in this particular case, you know, there's there's quite a bit of money there to be drawn down. But I suppose just to state that this really isn't an income support uh, mechanism. It really is to get the effective mitigation measure in place and to receive funding to do that. But the, the measure has to be effective and has to you know, give a water quality benefit. So just very briefly, um, I'll just give you a, a brief overview of some of the measures in a little more detail. So the farmer training course, farmers will be given the option to attend the training course as part of the water AP. So it is voluntary. But the topics that will be covered in the training course will be relevant to the significant local, local water quality pressure. So if, if pesticides is the main issue, that is what the, what the training will address. So it will be relevant to the water body. The nitrogen surplus, that really, um, I mean, that has been used in New Zealand for a long number of years. Um, but it is a simple accounting system where you have the farm gate inputs of nitrogen minus the farm gate outputs of nitrogen. Your nitrogen surplus then is an indicator of the potential risk of loss of nutrients to the aquatic environment. Um, so the farmer's payment here really to complete this nitrogen surplus, it's to allow for that discussion between the farmer and the advisor on how best to reduce the excess nitrogen in their farming system and what measures they can take on to reduce the nitrogen inputs and to improve the utilisation of their of their nitrogen inputs. Um. Multi-species swords, as it says, uh, that, that one is there. Obviously, with any of our, the measures in the EIP, there can't be dual funding. So if a farmer is availing of multi-species swords through the department scheme, um, it has to be separate ground to that. It can't be the same. We can't have dual funding um, with any of the department funded schemes. So whether it's the multi-species swords or acres or any different uh, other EIP, there can't be dual funding. Similarly, with the catch crops, um, if a farmer is using that for the eco scheme, it can't be funded under the Farming for Water EIP. So it has to be separate ground um, and that has to be very visual as well to a department inspector when they come out that they can see clearly whether it's acres catch crop or EIP catch crop. They have to be completely separate. But catch crops is a really, really critical measure for, for nitrogen um, and sediment soil structure um for tillage farmers so it's it's a really key measure and um, this is just two examples of the farmyard bucket and brush um again these are funded through the eip but i suppose the critical part of this is that they have to be used um 
So with all the measures in the IP, it really is critical, the management of the measure. You know, once the measure is funded, they have to be managed um, going forward. So just some pictures of mounded hedgerows. So the, the mound really is to intercept overland flow pathways. So where in heavier soil type you have that potential loss through overland flow, a mounded hedgerow can help to slow down the flow and break the pathway and reduce that risk and loss of sediment and phosphorus to water. The spatially targeted buffers would be similar. Um, so this is an example of the overland flow pathways uh, maps from the, the EPA and the delivery points. So in the these farms, you would be looking to target your spatially targeted buffer here to intercept that overland flow pathway and potentially a mounted hedgerow somewhere back up along that flow pathway as well. And this is just an example from uh, a one year EIP that myself and um, another ASAP advisor, Paddy Fitzgerald in Limerick, worked on. Um, so again, it was similar. We were targeting overland flow pathways uh, with spatially targeted buffers. So the farmer here, this was unfenced uh, spring, which is feeding into the main channel of the, the river deal. Um, and we asked the farmer to fence it out about 15 metres, about 20 metres long. And there was quite a slope there. And that farmer then planted it up with native um, with native trees. Um, so I just want to say thanks to Terry O'Mahony from Kerry Agribusiness for supplying me with these pictures. These, um, This is a willow bed that has gone in as part of a pilot project through the Farm for Water EIP in Castle Island. Um, so just to give people an idea of what the willow beds look like. Um, this one, I think, was about 80 metres or maybe 100 metres in length. Um, it was dug out um, and levelled. So the, the willow bed has to be levelled from, from the top to the bottom and from the left to right. You want even dispersal of the water through the willow bed. Um, there is a, uh, this will be a wetland planted filter at the head of the willow bed just to capture sediment planted up with wetland plants and then overflow into your willow bed. You can't see in the picture, but that would then was densely planted with willow trees. Um, so, you know, in theory, if we can get that kind of gray water from clean concrete yards in farmyards, divert it into one of these, capture the sediment, um, and then the willow trees then will take up any potential dissolved nutrients that might be there. Um, so fencing of streams and rivers and drains where they are, um, where, where livestock are entering into them and causing an impact on water quality, these will also be funded. Um, the fence has to be a minimum of one and a half metres out from the top of the bank of the surface water. Um, livestock obviously can't graze inside it. And the fencing has to be up to uh, the most relevant department specifications for fencing. Um, so we want to reduce the the number of livestock that are drinking directly and entering our water courses because you can see all the bank erosion and the damage that it that it causes. Um, there is also potential then to do wider margins, three, six uh, meter margins, both in uh, grassland and tillage scenarios. Um, and these images again are from the the deal EIP where you know we funded uh, these particular Items and again, these are eligible for funding through the Farming for Water EIP. So solar powered pumps, nose pumps and water trucks are all eligible to be funded through the Farming for Water EIP. So, so that's a very brief run through on it, um, Pat. Um, and we're happy to take any questions or comments or feedback that people may have. OK, thanks very much. That was uh, uh, comprehensive and uh, I suppose it, it, it should uh generate quite a few questions in, in relation to what is eligible and, and maybe details around some of, some of the eligibility. Uh, I see there's a, a question there. Uh, the first question that came in was, if you're in acres, can you avail of the EIP? I think you've already kind of alluded to that, but you might just uh, 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 indicate some of the, the issues around that. Yeah. So the, if you're in acres, you can apply to the EIP, but obviously whatever acres actions you're, you've already been funded under, you can't get dual funding on them. So catch crops would be one. Um, if you're applying for catch crops to, through the Farm for Water EIP, the catch crop um, in acres and the Farm for Water EIP have to be completely separate. So, you know, there is, there is potential um, to be in both schemes, but, you know, you really have to, be mindful of where your acres actions are 
Um, we have some EIP uh, measures that are, can go on acres parcels, but we have to, uh, I suppose you'd have to kind of go through it on an individual basis really to be sure. But, you know, you, if you are looking to go into the farm for water EIP, you have to let the ASAP advisor know you're in acres and where the measures are. And then you can kind of go from there. And I suppose a question there, if uh, some of the research or if some of the farmer interactions come up with novel solutions, can they be brought in as measures on an ongoing basis throughout the, the scheme? Yeah, um, there, there's great potential, I suppose, with EIPs because they're so flexible. Um, so, you know, if if a farmer has an idea um, and they discuss it with the ASAP advisor, that you know, they can apply for funding through the bespoke measure. Um, but what they need is to have, you know, details of the proposal and costings for the proposal. But definitely there's huge flexibility um, for measures to come in that way. And, you know, with research and everything on some of those measures, we can get great data and hopefully come up with a lot more solutions and a lot more measures. Yeah, and I, I suppose the, the, the ultimate aim is is hopefully that we will get to a point where we will learn enough from, from this to have broader implementation of, of, of measures across agri-environmental schemes. I yeah. that would be the history of the EIPs. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, there's great potential with this, particularly if you can get research on a lot of the measures. You know, if we can figure out, you know, um, which mitigation measures deliver the best um, potential for, you know, taking out sediment, taking out nutrients, um, the correct size to have them, the correct location, you know, there's huge potential there. Yeah, definitely. And I suppose the final question, and then I'll hand over because there is a lot of questions coming in. I'll hand over to Cahill. Uh, the uh, rainwater management plan, it, 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 as you described it, is, is seems to be the key to this. I know there's a lot of work and, and sometimes there's a bit of resistance to that level of, of intensive look at the farm, but it really is the key to establishing what needs to be done and where it needs to be done. Yeah, I mean, you really you can't do the application really without it. Um, so the asset assessment, um, baseline asset assessment is crucial to walk the the farmyard, um, to walk the farm and to look at the nutrient management um aspect of it as well. You really have to go through each aspect to figure out which mitigation measures are going to work and to potentially give you a good result. So it is critical, absolutely. Yeah. Paul, I hand over to you for some of the questions. Yeah, Maureen, I suppose the question came in here. Um, but how does the process work? So if a farmer and advisor comes up with a plan, um, what happens then or how, how long does it take to get approved maybe and maybe then the payments come in? Yeah, so the farmer and the advisor work together. They look where the risky areas are. They identify them, put them on their rainwater management plan. Um, they have to fill out then a more detailed Excel just saying, I want, Eva showed it there at the end, I want this measure, this amount of this measure, and it generates the the figure. That's then submitted to the IP team. Um, and it's initially checked then for, I suppose, completeness that you've submitted everything that you need to have. And then it's looked at by our scientist team to look at those measures. Are they the most appropriate measures for the pressures that are there? Um, and that, that goes through that validation process. The double funding check has to be done then at that stage as well. Um, so once that's done, then a letter of approval is sent to the farmer and the advisor. So the advisor is aware of what's going on. Uh, the measures are done and verification is sent in to us. And on your approval letter, it will tell you what the method of verification is for each measure. That's sent in and they, they can... I suppose they can install a measure, one of five, and claim the costs for that measure. You don't have to wait till you have everything done because obviously um, with seasons and that, there's certain things you can do and certain things you have to wait to get a window of opportunity for. Um, so they apply for, they send in their evidence then and it comes into our team and they're approved for payment and then the payment will issue. Um, the rainwater management plan, once it's approved, is paid. So you you may be in an instance where you actually get that payment for that rainwater management plan before you even get your approval letter. But once we've approved a rainwater management plan, it's paid. So that's they'll get a kind of an early payment there before any measures are put in. Um, in terms of the approval time that it takes, I suppose at the moment we're relatively early on in the project and everything had to be designed from scratch. So we've had we have had delays. Um, we've had feedback where we've had to change measures. That double funding issue 
and the previous question on whether you can be in acres or be in another um, departmental scheme, we obviously wanted to make that work. We didn't want to cut out anybody who was in acres or anybody who was in or who had applied through TAMS or any of those um, funding streams. We wanted to make sure that they could um, be brought into the process. That unfortunately has created an awful lot of work on our side, which has led to delays in the approvals. Um, so we we do have applications in there and we do have a backlog of applications, but we're working through those. So we'll be hoping over the next three or four weeks that we get all those approval letters out so that farmers know exactly what they can do and can plan accordingly. Yeah, and Emer, um, there's kind of a comment in here or a question that I suppose down in the, the southeast and the south, there's big issues with nitrates at the moment. And um, a, a lot of the measures, I suppose, in the EAP are, are physical measures for phosphorus and overland flow. But there is some strong nitrate measures there as well, isn't there? Yeah, um, so I suppose it's it's much easier to tackle the phosphorus and the sediment, you know, with physical measures. Um, so it 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 is actually easier to tackle those ones. But in terms of the nitrogen, um, the catch crops would be a critical one in a tillage scenario to mop up that excess um nitrogen that you know to reduce the potential for leaching. And uh, the multi species swords is also very um important to you know reduce the level of chemical input and potentially with the plantain to as a diuretic. Um, so there's those, but then the N surplus would be a key one too. So the N surplus figure um, is through AGNAV and the data from that is coming from the Board B audit. So your Board B audit, like to have the data going into that, um, you know, fairly accurate, you will get a reasonably accurate figure coming out then, but it is the data going in has to be correct to start with, get an accurate N surplus figure. I mean, in New Zealand, they've been using the N surplus figure for quite a number of years now. So it's really to try and uh, raise awareness on it and bring it into discussion groups and maybe have uh, group reports for this so that farmers will be aware of it and can really try to tackle it and to, um, you know, to reduce the potential um, there for nitrate le leaching. And you just mentioned N surplus there, but uh, it's a question, how has it been quantified? I, that's true, Agnav, I think that's coming in, is it? Yeah, it's true, Agnav. So um, the the data going into Agnav is coming from ICBF. So there's the milk sales, you know, there's the livestock sales. Then there would be all the data from the Board B audit. Um, so really, it's the quality of the data going in is critical. Um, but there, Agnav, that online platform, that is where the, the figure is being um, taken from. Yeah, and... Um... Question, maybe Maraid, for you. Uh, if if the EIP plan has been submitted already, and maybe it's a year or two in, and somebody comes up with another idea that they want to add to it, is that possible? It is possible. Yeah, we can we can accommodate that. Obviously, we'd like everybody from an admin burden point of view, everyone to apply once and apply for everything. But we understand that that's not always possible, so we can facilitate that. Yeah, and is there a kind of a cap on the amount of applications or money a farmer can put in? There's no cap on the amount of money at the moment. Um, I suppose if if there is a water quality benefit, um, an approval on water quality benefit for those measures, we're generally accepting those measures. But the applications that come in do go through a rigorous validation process. So some applications won't be approved for everything, um, but it won't be at the moment, certainly. It's not because they've exceeded a funding cap. Yeah, and just kind of someone just want, wondering, could you clarify what a contractor mobilization fee is. Yeah, yeah. so yes, I quite agree. So when we we looked at some of the the smaller measures, we have our I suppose our measures include a plant rate, but for some of the smaller measures, they wouldn't cover the cost of bringing an excavator onto a site. So we said we'd bring in a contractor mobilization fee. So it's literally to cover the cost of bringing a machine to site. Um. So that's that's what that is there for. Yeah. And another clarification as well, what's a uh, host a farmer payment? Yeah, so I suppose one of the key things that we see has been beneficial for the project is to have demonstration farms. So like that willow bed, the, the photos that Emer showed there down in Kerry, it's very easy to talk about things. It's not as easy to pick up exactly what an advisor might be talking about or what we might be talking about when we say in willow bed. So nothing beats seeing it. So we were asking farmers, well, are you willing to host farmers on your project, on your farm to see these physical measures in the ground. And if they take up that um, option and we use the farm as a demonstration site, they get a payment for that inconvenience. 
Yeah, super. Um, Emer, back to you again, a kind of a technical question based on mitigation. Um, somebody's asking a question around if a farmer has a drain on their farm that's that's going nowhere, can they cover it up? Or should they cover it up even? Yeah, well, drains are, they fall in under landscape features um, through the BIS application. So if you are closing in a drain, it's actually under BIS um, that you need to open a new drain somewhere else on the farm. So there's that aspect, first of all. Um, in the EIP, we would generally be more, um, we're happier to see open drains because open drains, uh, they have potential to um, mitigate nutrient loss and sediment loss. So where they're vegetated is actually better for water quality. So within a pipe, that can't happen. So um, generally speaking, open drains um, are positive, um, but it's obviously managing what's going into the drain is, is, is critical. And there's even probably a piece there where you can put an open drain in that's not connected to water as a, as a mitigation option. Yeah, um, exactly. Yeah, you can use open drains, open ended drains, I suppose, where they may be not directly connected. But there's great potential with the open drainage network that we have to like capture sediment and also to for uptake of dissolved nutrients. There's huge potential there. Yeah. Um, the training course, Emer, what, what does that involve or what's that going to look like? Is that a one on one or a group scenario or how often do you see it envisioned? I know you're in the early days yet, but what, what does that look like? So the training courses will be quite similar to the ASAP Farmer Streamside events that have been held over the last number of years. Um, it'll be groups of 30, 25 to 30 farmers within a water body. Hopefully, if, if there's enough farmers within a water body, it will be done at that scale um, or it can be broadened out if there aren't enough farmers within a particular water body. But it will be done in a group setting. And uh, depending on the time of year, then I suppose over the winter, it potentially could be indoors. But ideally, it'll be out on farm beside a stream and with the host farmer payment and the host farmer measure that Maraid explained, you know, if ideally what we want is to have those training courses out on the host farmers um, farm to show measures that have gone in place on that farm through the EIP and just to show farmers what they look like and how they're working, how they function, you know, how the farmer did what he did. And to get that peer to peer learning will be really critical. Um, but we'll also look at the local water quality and what the issues will be there. Um, and it'll be very relevant to what the issue is in the water body. So if nitrate is the key issue, then the focus in that training course will be on nitrogen. And equally, if it's pesticides or sediment and phosphorus, the, the key focus of the training will be on those measures. And um, we we'll, uh -huh. Sorry, there's, a, there's a, I suppose, a grouping of questions that are, are, are very important, I think, in relation to the who can apply, uh, what can the role of, of other advisors be? Is it totally ex uh, limited to ASAP advisors? And I, I, I just think we might just look for a bit of clarity on that and, and where it might be going and maybe examples of where other advisors have got involved in the process. Um, yeah. Yeah, go Sorry, go ahead, Maraid. Um, so I suppose the, the project was built on the ASAP programme and based on being the kind of final piece in the puzzle in the funding to be the funding mechanism for those recommendations. Um, so that's where that's the core part of the IP. Now, we do recognise that there are other um, other avenues that people might want to use. Um, we're looking at the likes of the group water schemes and the group water scheme managers there. So they're doing a lot of work at the moment. Um, around these water quality measures in particular areas. They have networks of farmers there um, that they, they're working with at the moment. Um, a lot of the measures are measures that we can fund. So we're looking at um, the potential to upskill those. A lot of them are very experienced in this field. They have the background required to be able to make those assessments because they're doing them on a daily basis. Um, so we'd be looking at routing some applications through there. Um, we also, um, within our own team, have project advisors. So there's a team of 10 there who are currently doing the validation and setting up the processes, but they will also be able to go out and bring in applications from farms. So if we get maybe a, a local authority contact us and said, you know, with in our work, we have identified an area where um, supplementary measures would be very beneficial, our own team then can go out and make that application. I also mentioned there in the presentation about the community and leveraging community groups. 
So we have five community animator posts within the EIP team um, that we're currently evaluating at the moment. So they will be a role within those organisations who, again, will have an existing network, an existing focus, um, and have a water quality focus. Um, so those advisors will also be bringing in applications to the scheme. So they're the kind of ones we're working at the moment. Uh, we're also, I suppose, looking at where Meat Industry Ireland can come in and what uh, they can do in terms of um, bringing boots on the ground, I suppose, to, to uh, bring in some of those applications. So we've we've set up the project around ASAP, but now we're looking at well, where can we go from there and how can we um, how can we bring in a wider team to try and um, install water quality measures? Through and there was some of that done with tillage advisors in, in a, exactly, a, a yeah. trial this year. Yeah, yeah. so some of the, the wider Chagask advisory team through the tillage advisors came in to look at a catch crop pilot then that we had down in the southeast, and that worked very well. Okay, there's a kind of a, a, a fairly key clarification, I think, uh, in, in one of the questions uh, we said on, on settlement uh, reed beds in, in particular, but I, I suppose it applies to willow beds. Uh, farmers should be aware there's some poor advice uh, being, being given. Uh, 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 and I suppose a particular reference to um, where farmers were being advised that soil water and soil ejectment uh, could be filtered through it. I think, uh, Emer, it, it might be appropriate to nail on the head that what we're trying to do here is clean, make sure everything leaving the farmyard is as absolutely clean as possible and that you're using it for further cleaning, but that there, is, there will be no provision for letting soil water or soil effluent down to be cleaned in these, in these measures. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so we have to be very, very clear about this, that we are not funding um we're not funding integrated constructed wetlands number one um and we're not funding anything that already has to be collected under the nitrates um rules and regulations and the gap regulations so for cross compliance all the cross compliance um issues that the department inspect on a regular basis they are still you know they're still mandatory and they're still a baseline so everything that we're looking to fund is in addition to that and it's supplementary to that um, so, for example, the farmyard, the two two chamber farmyard settlement tank in Willowbed, that is not to deal with dairy washings. It's not to deal with silage effluent and it's not to deal with slurry. Um, it's only our soil water or soil to water. Yeah, exactly. It's not to deal with any of those. Its only function is to deal with um, clean concreted yards that would be trafficked by machinery, capturing sediment and potentially associated nutrients with that sediment. Um, but the baseline mandatory gap requirements are still there. Um, and if a farmer puts in a two chamber settlement tank in a willow bed, you know, it is to be managed as outlined in the, the guidance document. So, you know, if in the future a farmer mismanages it or doesn't manage it correctly, it can still be, you know, it will still be subject to um you know checks from the department or a county council. So it has to be managed as it's been set out to be managed and it will require management ongoing. Um, so the first chamber of that settlement tank would have to be emptied every maybe three to six months, depending, um, you know, if it's left too long, it can solidify. So down at the bottom, so you would want to, to empty that regularly. Um, and you have to make sure as well then that the willow trees are coppiced on um, maybe a three to five year rotational basis. So they have to be actively growing to, um, you know, to be constantly taking up those dissolved nutrients that are associated with any sediment in the settlement tank. Um, so there is a bit of work in them. It's not a case that you put these in and you walk away because, you know, definitely then you will be leaving yourself open to to issues down the line. So they have to be managed um, ongoing. Just on that question as well. Um... It's just there's kind of a, a bit of questions they're wondering about, I suppose, with increased regulation, uh, increased inspection with county councils, fisheries, the department. Um, is everybody singing from the one hymn sheet as regards to nature based solutions, or is there potential um, for somebody, somebody from one organization to think this is not correct? Yeah. Um, 
well, as much as possible, we're trying to work with all the different um bodies. So like inland fisheries and the Department of Ag and the county councils. Um, so, you know, we are meeting with them ongoing and some of those meetings have to take place as well. But there is um as a principle, in principle, there is, I suppose, agreement um to a certain extent, but there is skepticism, I would say, definitely about them. Um but I think this is the key part for the EIP is for all of us to kind of get research on them and to figure out exactly, you know, what is the efficacy of all of these measures and where is the potential for them in the future. Um, but absolutely, there has to be um, agreement all right, from from each party. Um, but like I say, you know, with the Department of Agriculture, they've been quite clear to us that, you know, in principle, this this is all very good but if it's mismanaged or not managed correctly you know then you are leaving yourself open so it it's it's all down to the management of them and what's going into them it can't be like pat said you know soiled water dairy washings silage effluent or slurry it has to be um from the clean yards on the farm i'm worried that one for you and a really important question is will applying to the waters eip uh, potentially bring on a department inspection no I suppose it's a short answer where when you submit your rainwater management plan, it's solely the measures that we can fund. We don't have any information on compliance issues. Obviously, you'll have had your asset assessment and if the compliance issues come up and are discussed there, that's a confidential process. We don't see that information and we don't want to see that information. So we're solely concerned with the measures that we can fund and the appropriateness of those measures. There's a question that has been asked a few times uh, 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 and, and it's been likened to the question of what is a tracker mortgage that used to be asked about 10 years ago is what is a swale? Either. <laughs> <laughs> so a swale is basically um, a vegetated um, depression that can convey water from one area to another. So if you think of it, I suppose, maybe in a tillage scenario where you have sloped ground and you want to capture what's coming down that slope and you want to send it maybe to a sediment pond, you have a, a dry vegetation, you can have a dry or a wet swale, but we'll just go with the dry one for simplicity. So it's basically like a small depression. It's like a mini drain, a dry drain, but it's quite shallow um, and gently sloped. And it basically conveys the water a certain direction. So it can convey the water into a sediment pond um, or a sediment trap. Um, so that's, I suppose, probably the easiest way to describe it. it it's really coming from the suds, from the the urban um, space that the swales are coming from. Um, but they are they have great potential, again, to to convey or direct your your overland flow or your water, or your sediment a certain direction so that you can then mitigate whatever it is, uh, like whatever nutrient it is that that needs to be um, captured. And um, I just, is there any trend developing from uh, some of the applications coming in, kind of what's the most common issues that you're kind of seeing or that, that people are applying for? Yeah, I suppose there's great interest in the willow bed, in fairness. Um, and, it, and it's that visual piece again, like there's been articles done on it and, um, you know, there's good detail on, on the steps of the construction process. Uh, the challenge then is to make sure it's used appropriately. Um, there's a lot, I suppose, of um, fencing off water courses and removing animals from water courses and the alternatives that we can fund through that. Um, they're kind of the main things. The obviously in the the nitrate heavy areas, then the nitrogen surplus measure would be a popular one as well. Um, in terms of looking at well, what's impacting that figure and how that can be how that can be improved both from a, a losses point of view and from an economic point of view. I suppose one thing that we haven't dealt with, and it's it's kind of part of the training and it's it's part of, of what we what is done with farmers uh, 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 as part of the process, is the whole issue of, of better management of nutrients to make sure that there's safer application, that there's less risk in, in, in the general farming practices as well. You, you might comment on that. Yeah, that would be a key part. Yeah, definitely of the ASAP assessment in general. Um, so you're you know looking at the baseline soil fertility. Um, using NMP online for the various color coded maps is a really great tool. 
Um, and on NMP online now, the pit maps are there, the flow pathway maps are there, the water courses are all on that. So it makes that piece much, much easier. Um, you can, you know, at a glance identify where the the low soil indexes are, where the si high ones are, and where you should target your your organic manures and your fertilizers going forward. I suppose sulfur is another key one um to address as well. So uh definitely you know, the nutrient management side is is a huge aspect of it and trying to have it as efficient as possible. And it also ties in with your um, greenhouse gases and the signpost um, side of things, um, particularly the nitrogen surplus that very much ties in with what the signpost advisors are doing as well. So there is uh, that collaboration as well and that's, you know, co-benefits there as well from all of that. Yeah, so so really, the, I suppose what we're focusing on in here is on the payments from the EIP, but it's part of that bigger process of managing and protecting from nutrient loss uh, to the environment. Okay, I think we're going to have to leave it. We've we've it's it's ten thirty, and thank you very much for a really good presentation. Uh, I think it it has clearly outlined what's what's involved. Uh, listen, I wish you the the, uh, the best of luck in terms of. The rollout, it's it's going to be challenging. There's going to be more problems. Uh, and hopefully there's going to be a lot more applications coming in in, in, in the near future as we as as you move towards scale on that. So thanks very much for the presentations and and, and good luck with the, the, the work uh, uh, coming up. Uh, thanks to Cahill. Uh, just to say next week, uh, we'll be joined by by Shea Phelan and and Shea will will be talking about uh, 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 sustainable tillage uh, uh, farming practices. So until then, uh, goodbye. Enjoy your weekend and stay safe.